Today's episode of Your Money, Your Wealth is all about strategizing. Joe and Big Al answer questions about coordinating Social Security benefits with Roth contributions and required minimum distributions, weighing the Social Security restricted application against survivor benefits, the windfall elimination provision for teachers, whether to take RMDs from a brokerage IRA or an annuity, and of course Joe will explain why that annuity is a terrible idea, and the fellas will also get into how to split an inherited annuity four ways and how to split a house eight ways. I'm producer Andy Last, and here are the hosts of Your Money, Your Wealth, Joe Anderson, CFP, and Big Al Clopine, CPA. You got a question? That's what we do all day now. And yeah, it is what we It's all we do. It's it. It seems. And we try to get them all grinded out here. I yeah, think you do. guys are popular now. We could be. Except they're... We still only have 20 listeners because they're the same people over and over again. Right, I know. Yeah, I feel bad for you. So here's 15 questions. <laughs> I know you guys are struggling. We do have that actually from James, I think. He, uh, he sent in about 50 questions for yeah, you guys okay. to answer. We got Peter and Susie from San Diego. Hi, Joe and Al. Huh. No, Andy. <laughs> it's been a few years since my wife and I graduated. From the seminar series you presented at USD. I don't think Al was anywhere near USD a few years ago, Peter and Susie. I taught one course at USD. <laughs> yeah, with I you. remember that. That was an afternoon course, and the guy fell asleep, right? <laughs> he fell asleep when you were talking. <laughs> yeah, he yeah, perked up you, when I talked. Remember you were talking about oil and gas? Oh, or he something? loved that. <laughs> he did love that. <laughs> you were talking about Roth conversions. <laughs> <Norris laughs> oh, my God. He was in the front row, too. <laughs> I did. Oh, we both know who that was. Yep, we do. All right. I've been putting my uh, degree to good use, converting traditional IRA funds to my Roth as tax amount allows. All right. Good for you. Um, apparently, that's all we teach, too. <laughs> apparently. <laughs> I was trying to you talk about something else. You it makes the biggest difference. <laughs> it can. It can. <laughs> In some circumstances. Oh, gosh. I just turned 69 last month. And we'll be retiring in July 1st, 2021, when I'm 70, which I'll be um, which I'll be turning in the previous year. I've had some questions that aren't clearly spelled out in any of the information that he can find online. Okay. All right. Let's kind of see what he's got here. Um, all right. During all of 2020, I'll be working full time. And presumably, I should start collecting Social Security in October 2020 when I turned 70. Yes, you yeah. would want to collect yeah, your we'll Social Security as... At age 70. Yeah, there's no down downside of collecting it then. In fact, there's only a negative because if you wait, you don't you, get that money. Yep, you're losing out. Am I still allowed to make a full Roth contribution for 2020? Yes, as long as you have earned income in 2020. Um, there is no age limitation for Roth IRAs. It's only traditional IRAs. Yeah, you just need to have earned income, and the earned income that you would have from the beginning of the year would, would be sufficient. Yeah. Um, we don't know how much he's making, but if, you, if you're making what's it, um, under $193,000 as a married couple, If you keep reading on, he tells you how go. much he's going to make. Right. Oh, sorry. Okay. Will, will <laughs> I get a full Social Security payment for October 2020 or partial? I should be getting about three thousand dollars a month, Social Security. Um, okay, does working full time affect Social Security amount? I make about one hundred forty thousand dollars a year. So no, you answer my question. So you're good. Roth IRA contributions, yes, check the box. Uh, will I get a full Social Security payment in October twenty twenty or partial? Well, when's your birthday? October what? It doesn't say. Yes, you would get a full benefit for October. Yeah, the, the, I think a lot of people, they hear stuff about if you make a certain amount of income, like over $17,000, you don't get to keep all your Social Security. That's only when you're under full retirement age, which right now is age 66. So at age 70, it doesn't really matter what you make. You'll get your full Social Security. Yeah, so you're good. You can make 140 that year. You're over full retirement age. Um, collect at 70. doesn't matter how much you make. You're going to um, receive your uh, full benefit. Uh, 2021. When I'm 70, I'll get a half-year, full-pay, six-month pension, about 7 k a month, and 12 months Social Security. 
Does working six months in 2021 affect Social Security? I.e., if the six months total is more than the lowest of the 35 years, will 21 count instead? The answer is yes. They would increase your benefit the following year. Absolutely will. Correct. So if you're making $140,000 a year, you work six months, okay? Um, or if you wanted to continue to work the full year, Yes, your Social Security would increase the following year because they take the highest 35 years. So that year, if it was higher than any other year, that would replace that year. Um, so it's only going to benefit you cash flow-wise if you continue to work. Am I still allowed to make a full Roth IRA contribution in 2021? I've already answered that. Yes. Will I need to make an RMD during 2021? The transition to retirement certainly has a few financial considerations. Thank you very much. You guys are very entertaining. We listen to your YouTube presentations. All right. So I kind of wanted to answer that as I went there because yeah, there's, there's about 15,000 questions that Peter's asking <laughs> us. So he asked if he can make a full Roth contribution for 2020, and then he asked if he can make a full Roth contribution for 2021. Yeah. Because they're two different situations well, in his mind. In 2020, he's working. He's got income. He makes $140,000 a year. As long as he has earned income, you can make a full Roth IRA contribution. Yeah, as long as the total income is less than 193000 If you have earned income in 2021... You can make a full Roth IRA contribution in 2021, even though it's a half year. That's that's plenty of income. You have to just you have to make over seven thousand dollars, which is the current amount for a, a Roth contribution if you're 50 and older. So, will I need to make a RMD during 2021? Um, you turned 70 and a half in 2021, so you would have to take an RMD that year or the following year um, in 2022. Right. So you could pick 2021 or 2022. 2022. <laughs> if you take it in 2022, you would just have to take two of them. Right. Which may work out better because... Because he's working six months in 2021. Right. On the other hand, he's got a lot of pension income, so maybe it doesn't really matter that much. I, I don't know, but you got to do the math. But yeah, you can either take it in 2001 and 2021 and one in 2022 and so on, or you can take two of them in 2022, that's fine. You're just going to have more income, more required minimum distribution income in that year. Yeah. And, and, I, and I think, Joe, to me, it, it, it really depends upon what your income looks like in the year you turn 70 and a half versus the following year as to whether you want to do one and one or do none and then two in the following year. Because what you're trying to do is stay out of higher tax brackets. That's really what it comes down to. Um, what Peter was referring to, Peter and Susie, um, we teach adult education classes all over Southern California. Uh, we teach them in Los Angeles, Irvine, Brea, um, San Diego, all over yep. San Diego. Sure. Um, if you want to attend one of the classes, as Peter and Susie did, and apparently they didn't, they, they got some stuff, some didn't stick. They learned Roth conversions. Yeah. <laughs> you apparently talked about it. Yeah. Apparently. But the whole Social Security, I must have only spent about 30 seconds on that. <laughs> it wasn't clear. <laughs> um, or maybe it, that was the class it, I was talking about oil and gas. If you live in Southern California and would like to get more of the tools and confidence you need to make informed decisions about retirement, like Peter and Susie did, you can sign up for one of Pure Financial Advisors' two-day retirement classes in San Diego or Orange County. Get the information you need to help you plan the retirement you've always dreamed of. Learn about your retirement needs and expenses, investments and sources of retirement income, risk management, asset protection, estate planning, and Social Security and Roth conversions. For dates, times, and locations, visit yourmoneyyourwealth.com and click Retirement Classes. Hey, which one are we doing here? John from Tucson, Arizona? Yeah. Yes, sir. All right. Johnny from Tucson, Arizona. Ever been to Tucson, Big Al? Um, I don't think so. Really? Yeah, I've been to Phoenix and out west a little, uh, out east, but I don't think I've been to Tucson. That's where Dave Clark, he lives I, in Tucson. I, I know. My, I have family that lives in Tucson. I've been to Tucson I know you do. Many, many, many times. times. Love Tucson. We have a question from Dave in Arizona. I wonder if it is Dave Clark. <laughs> we'll, we'll get there. <laughs> so, when, when am I up for my review? <laughs> am I going to get a raise? Yeah. <laughs> What's... What's cost of living this year? <laughs> Dear Joe and Al, great, great show and info. All right. Nice. Thank you. 
Uh, my question is about restricted application in dying before 70. Jeez, John. <laughs> we got serious stuff. Wow. Well, <laughs> woo. My wife is 66 and I'm 70. She started restricted application September of 2019, so just a few months ago. She is receiving 50% of my full retirement amount. If I were to die before she reached age 70, could she then stop the restricted application, apply for widow survivor benefit until she reaches 70, and then apply for her own age 70 benefit, which would be a much larger amount? Okay, um, there's a little backstory, I guess, behind all of this. So there is. Maybe we can help our listeners out. Sure. Um, do you want me to take a stab, or do you want to go for it? Yeah, you're good at this one. All right, so restricted application. So what a restricted application is, is that John's wife could either take her benefit or a spousal benefit. Usually, the law changed, and I can get into the, the recent law change, but because of their age, they were grandfathered in for this type of um, claiming strategy. So John is collecting his benefit. His wife says, you know what? I don't want to take my own benefit. I want mine to continue to grow. Because if you let your own benefit grow from your full retirement age to age 70, you get an 8% delayed retirement credit. Each year. Each year. So it's a pretty big deal if you can let it grow, right? But the problem is, is that people like John are morbid. They're like, what if I die, right? So what happens if I die and I delayed it and all of this other stuff? What happens? But I think John's a very loving person because he cares about his wife and wants to make sure that she's going to maximize the benefit. Yeah, so he's concerned about the next four years because he's thinking, what if she is not 70 when I pass away? Correct. So what happens, so what, what John's wife is doing, she filed a restricted application that allows her not to claim her own benefit but to claim the spousal. So she is claiming half of John's benefit, his full retirement age benefit. Yeah, which, by the way, is probably different than what he's currently receiving, right? Depending upon when he started taking the... the yeah, I don't know when... Like, 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 let's just say he started taking it at age 70. She doesn't get half of his age 70 benefit. She gets half of his benefit at, at what it would have been at age 66. Correct. And if she claimed the spousal benefit at age 62, she would receive... Actually, not 50%. E- even less. Less, yes. Right? Correct. Um, so she's claiming that. And then so John's saying, all right, well, how about if I die? Yeah, in the next four years. I, I get hit by a bus, struck by lightning playing golf, and then all of a sudden what happens to my wife's benefit? Can she then say, I want to claim the survivor benefit? So we're getting all three benefits in yeah, one we, question. That's pretty good. So what a survivor's benefit is is that she then would go to John's benefit, okay? So she could claim John's benefit, depending on what John's benefit was. So she took that, let's say John's benefit is $2,000, okay? So she is claiming the spousal benefit today. She's getting $1,000. Let's assume her full retirement age benefit is $2,000 as well. John decided to claim his benefit at full retirement age, take the $2,000, John's wife, Said, I'm not. I'm going to let mine continue to grow, eight percent per year. I want to claim mine at age seventy. So two thousand is going to be worth twenty six hundred bucks, something right. like that a month. Yep. Right. So she was, she's like, I want the twenty six hundred. But in the meantime, I'm going to claim the spousal benefit. I'm going to claim a thousand dollars off of John's record. So now John's claiming his two thousand. She's got a thousand. They're living the happy life, living three thousand dollars. John gets struck by lightning. He passes away. Now what the hell happens? Is what his question is. Sure. Okay. So what happens is she mourns John because she's sad. You died. Then she calls Big Al. <laughs> Says, what, what, "What do I do?" She can't claim to the widow's benefit. Widow's benefit. Right, survivor. Survivor benefit. So now she's going to get 2000 bucks because your benefit was 2000 So now her benefit is going to still continue to accrue. When she turns 70, then she would flip hers on to get the 2600 If, in fact, it's greater. Yes. Yeah, so, so yeah. In other words, uh, let me <laughs> – you've kind of made this long drawn out. <laughs> the answer is very simply yes. She can immediately switch to the survivor's benefit if that's a greater benefit. I just wanted to help the listeners to paint the picture of how know, complicated got, this stuff can be. Got, you're kind of going in circles there for a while. 
I was not. <laughs> that sounded like it to me. So the answer is yes. Yeah, she can claim survivor's benefit immediately. That's the answer. Got it. All right. Let's go to Mark from Illinois. Hello. Hello, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> I always enjoy the shows. My question revolves around windfall and elimination provision as applied to a public school teacher in Illinois. It's his wife, Al, just, to, just in case you're keeping score. Got it. Currently drawing um, her $4,000 a month pension that also is eligible for Social Security from a previous job. Um, should a high-earning spouse, me, draw early Social Security at 62 versus drawing down $1.5 million 401k IRA to put off Social Security till full retirement age. Given that teacher spouse cannot draw against spouse's Social Security in the 401k IRA acts as an insurance policy. Assume both of us are retired at 60, no debts, no kids, not planning a move. Plus a $50,000 cash balance retirement plan will also join the mix at age 60. Thanks for your thoughts. 500000 What did I say? 50000 Sorry, Mark. Didn't mean to tr- shortchange you there. 500000 now. Okay. All right. Um, so I, I get his thought process here. Right. So he's like, all right, the wife's got 4000 bucks. That's good. Should he claim Social Security at 62 versus... Taking dollars from the retirement account. What do you think? Well, he says, should a high-earning spouse me draw early? So I guess, I guess, I guess, in a later sentence, he says they're they're retiring at age sixty. Because when I when I first saw that, I thought he was working at age sixty-two, and then you would not because you would you'd make too much because of the income limitation. But he's saying that because he's looking at the windfall elimination provision of a claiming strategy saying given that teacher spouse cannot draw against spouse's social security. Well, her pension is $4,000. So, is he saying if he dies the 1.5 is going to be the insurance policy or if she dies there's no spousal benefit, but I don't know what she claimed as a pension benefit. Is there a survivor benefit on the pension? So she could say, you know, 100% survivor, so $4,000 a month for me, and then if I die, then Mark gets $4,000. But it also sounds, well, I'm a high-wage earner. I have a higher benefit. Even at 62, my benefit is going to be pretty good. So maybe I supplement my income at 62, right, to live off of, so I don't have to touch the retirement accounts. And if I were to pass away or the spouse passes away, we still have a larger nest egg because the draw the drawdown was a lot less in those earlier years. Right. So that's a great question. I don't think it matters about the windfall elimination provision. I think he just wants to claim early just because he likes to see the balance of his retirement accounts like every other uh, American that claims Social Security earlier. And so with school teachers, they don't go into Social Security. They go into CalSTRS or, in his situation, TRS, Teachers Retirement System. Right. And when you're a teacher, even though you had another job where you could get Social Security benefits, there's something called a windfall elimination provision that basically eliminates a lot of the Social Security benefit because the government doesn't really want you to double dip. So his question was like, my Social Security benefit is going to be fairly sizable. Maybe I maxed out. Yeah, because I made a good high income. And then in the question we had with John, he was talking about survivor benefits, spousal benefits, and things like that. Well, if you have a spouse that's a school teacher that didn't put a lot of money into the Social Security system, they put into another pension plan, well, they don't qualify for any of those types of benefits. Yeah, not even the survivor. Right. So he's saying, man, if I waited to get my Social Security right, and have this big plan, and if I die, my wife's not really going to receive a lot of benefit from it, so maybe I just take it as soon as I can get it. So if I die, this big nest egg is going to take care of her. Yeah, and I think usually when we talk about husband and wife, we want the person with the highest benefit to wait as long as they can so the survivor gets the higher the two benefits. But in this case, the survivor, if it's her, wouldn't necessarily get his benefit because of this windfall elimination uh, provision. So I would say in this particular case, you almost think about it as if you're single, wouldn't you? Because if, if Mark felt like he had a long life expectancy, you'd probably wait till 70. And if he didn't, you might take it earlier. Yeah, but the $4,000 pension is more than probably what his survivor benefit is going to be anyway. Could be. (laughs) Right? So it doesn't matter. 
in my opinion. Well, plus he's got a lot of other assets, and we don't know what he's spending, so it's kind of hard to answer. Right. So he's all right. So the wife is going to have about fifty thousand dollars income coming in. Right. He's got his social security. I would push it out. I'd wait. Because longevity risk is probably a bigger risk than, you know, you're, you're protecting your surviving spouse when she's already got a fat pension. Agreed. And that's what we normally say. Push it out as long as you can unless you have health issues. or you know, Impaired life, life expectancy. Life, see, that, that's what I'm saying. As a single, if he, w- if he were single, you would push it out till 70 just because of longevity risk. Unless you had a pretty good sense you were not going to live that long, then you'd take it earlier. But what do most people do? Well, they take it as early as they can. And why do they do that? Because they don't want to. They don't want to use their <laughs> their retirement accounts. No, they like to look they, at they that balance. They like to balance. see that statement balance that keeps growing <laughs> instead of go, coming down. I know. It's like I don't want to draw on that. But right? the, the, good uh, savers are terrible spenders. Yeah, but I will say, it, and it depends upon how you calculate your assumptions. But eighty years old is somewhere around the break-even point if you want to think about it that way. So, John, if you think you're going to live 80 or, or longer, wait till age 70 or wait as long as you can. Actually, this is Mark. Mark, sorry. Oh, John's the one before. Thank yeah. you. Um, and if you don't think you're going to make it to 80 uh, for one reason or another, maybe you take it earlier. That's what I would say. There's a lot more to it, you know. Um, but they're retiring early. How much money are they spending? You know, it looks like they're going to have a couple million dollars in tax-deferred accounts. Does it make sense to draw from tax-deferred accounts that are not tax-favored versus your Social Security that is going to be tax-favored to push that out to have a higher benefit? Um, you know, you put the tax yeah. equation in there, too. I, oh, mean, I, I, I think it probably makes sense to push it out. I agree, unless he feels like he's has life impaired. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Obviously, there is a lot to this, and actually, there are over 2,700 rules around claiming Social Security. Since it is one of the most important decisions you'll make for retirement, it might be a good idea to download our Social Security Handbook. It'll walk you through who's eligible, how benefits are calculated, the difference between collecting early and late, working while taking Social Security, the rules around spousal, survivor, and divorce benefits, and the all-important taxation of your Social Security benefits. Click the link in the description of this episode in your podcast app to visit the show notes and download the Social Security Handbook. Yours free from Joe and Big Al and your money, your wealth. You want to go to Stan? Sure. All right. We got Stan from Richmond, Virginia. Nice. All right. Um, Because thank you for your informative podcast. All right. You're welcome. I have an RMD question. Here's my situation. By the way, required minimum distribution is what (laughs) RMD stands for. Oh, you used your cough button. I did. First time in five years. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) pretty good. Oh, boy. Okay. Uh, Here's my situation. I have two IRAs. Any thoughts regarding from which I should start taking RMDs and when? I want to start RMDs in 2020 as I turn 70 and a half, although I could delay until 2021. One IRA is a brokerage with a balance of about 75K. The other IRA is an annuity and has a current cash balance of $250,000, but it has a withdrawal base of $330,000. So he's got a guaranteed... Lifetime withdrawal benefit Got on it. this annuity contract. <coughs> so is, um, this annuity is making me sick. <laughs> this is what's happening. <laughs> <laughs> and so he's got a withdrawal base of 330K. Okay. Each year, <laughs> I don't withdraw the income. Base goes up by about 20K. And his income would increase by about $1,200 a year. At 70 and a half, it would be about $21,000 per year. Once I start withdrawals, the increase stops and never resumes. At age 75, my level withdrawal rate bumps to 65 from 6 at 70, blah, 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 blah. All right. He's married. Okay. And he doesn't need the money. Okay. So he's bought a product that is giving him a guaranteed income for life that he doesn't need. So there's some flaws in his planning right away. So he needs to take an RMD. Should he take it from the seventy-five thousand, or should he take it from this product that he purchased that has this, you know, all sorts of different bells and whistles on it that's probably costing him a fortune, and he's paying for all of this insurance that he doesn't necessarily need. Yeah. By the way, let me stop you one second. So when you have IRAs, you can have 
two IRAs, five IRAs, 10 IRAs, you can take your required minimum distribution out of one or two or four or all 10 in any way that you want. So that's what he's asking. Should you take it out of one or the other? Now, by the way, if you have multiple 401k accounts, you have to take a required minimum distribution from each 401k. So just remember that. So Stan's asking, hey, I'm married. We don't need the RMD money for our central expenses, but we'd like you know, a couple of extra stuff uh, for travel, supporting our children, student loan repayments, entertainment, qualified charitable deductions. Um, we have other taxable and Roth accounts uh, that have modest account balances. With the RMDs, we might nudge into the 22% federal tax bracket. And with the full guaranteed benefit um, of this annuity product, we would uh, very likely do so, in my opinion. That would not be a killer. Okay, cool. Our Social Securities are already taxed at 85% due to my pension income. I'm actually one year younger than my wife, but she has the better longevity based on our parents' lives and gender. I am leaning on taking the RMD or perhaps more like a Roth IRA conversion from the brokerage IRA and then let's, let's the annuity continue to increase. On the other hand, one point of an annuity is to outlive my original investment. Only if there's a cash value when I die, uh, can my wife continue to receive the guaranteed income? I do not have some permanent life insurance. He so, does have some. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I do have some permanent life insurance to help my wife after death. Uh, thank you very much. So the real question is, he's got an annuity that uh, each year he gets a higher income benefit for life. And should he kind of keep that there because of the higher income benefit and take the required minimum distribution from his regular brokerage account, or, or should he take it out of the uh, annuity? So what say you? I think he's already made up his mind. He's just trying to verify you agree with him. No, I would blow out of the annuity. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't agree with him. <laughs> but I think Stan likes this annuity, but I don't truly think he, under, he, he, he knows the product. Um, well, so there, let's let's start with the cash balance versus the withdrawal base. Cash balance is two hundred fifty thousand. So does that mean if he were to pass away, that's what his wife gets? Is that what that means? Yeah, the the, the withdrawal base is f- that's, income only. That's income only. So yeah. in other words, that that has nothing to do with what you get if you pass away. That's just what your income is based on. Correct. Okay. So there's probably a roll up of seven percent on the product. So he purchases for X. It's probably doubled in the last ten years, and now he's getting a five in that. But he's seventy and a half. So his life expectancy is what fifteen years, yeah. and he hasn't even pulled any money out of it. So that's why the insurance company's saying we love this guy. We love yeah. Stan. Just because yeah, yeah here because we're, we're charging you a ton of fees to hold this product, and then we're going to show you these hypotheticals. Here, keep waiting, keep waiting, keep waiting. Don't take any money out of this product. Don't take any money out of this product, and we'll show you these increases in your guaranteed income withdrawal benefit. Yeah, for life. For life, because all they're going to end up doing is give you your own money back. That's the cash balance. (laughs) Yes. Got it. So, you know, and then that's what he said. He goes, well, if the cash balance is gone, then there's really no insurance for my my wife. Now, if Stan lives to 100... 105. Yeah, then it's it all good. Works out pretty good. Looks pretty good. Um, so that's besides the point. He, he's not asking me my opinion on his annuity. He's asking me, when, what, take it out of the brokerage account. Who cares, right? Because, <laughs> you know, keep your annuity, spend a bunch of money, keep those insurance companies in business. You know? But I would relook at my overall strategy because he wants to do charitable deductions with it. So he's buying this product that is super expensive that he's not necessarily using because that extra dollars in his retirement account, he doesn't need it for a guaranteed income. He wants to use it for some travel, maybe help pay the kids, right? And then he wants to do QCDs. <laughs> what What are you doing, Stan? <laughs> so anyway. All right. It's not Stan's fault. It's the insurance agent that sold him that. It probably looked good. But I would convert the seventy five thousand bucks and then I would just maybe get a second opinion on the the insurance product that you purchased from a fee only fiduciary that doesn't sell products just to so you truly understand what's your internal rate of return. Or that's what he wants that's what I would tell Stan to do. What right. is your internal rate of return on this product? Or if he gets another opinion and he likes the annuity, then keep the then annuity. Keep the annuity. Take the required minimum distribution out of the brokerage account. Don't convert it because you're going to want to use that money for your RMDs, so you don't have to touch the annuity. Okay. Yep, that's uh-huh. the other approach. All right. Uh, thanks a lot for the question, Stan. We got 
Abel. No location given. Where is that? Where is Abel? Yeah. Abel. Where the hell are you? Hello. I received a death beneficiary IRA from my father. It's currently in an annuity, and I'm inquiring on splitting it up with my three siblings. It's 100000 bucks. What would be the best way to distribute this money without being heavily taxed? Wow. What do you think, Al? Well, it sounds like Abel got the uh, IRA from father, uh, and uh, I'm just guessing perhaps that the father just put... Uh, Abel's name on it without including the, uh, the the siblings, and so splitting it with my three siblings. So I guess there's four people, and so for some reason this went to Abel. So I think, or maybe Abel could be the trustee. Could be. Yep. Yeah, it could be. I guess if it, like let's just say you inherit an IRA, for example, and for some reason you want to include your brother and sister that. We're not it because your mom, you know, your favorite. Oh, yes, I'm yeah. the favorite for sure. <laughs> so it's in your name. You can't just say, here, you take a third of it. You're not really allowed to do that. Can I disclaim? If you disclaim it, then it goes back to the will or trust, and it may not go where you want it to go. You could do that. I, I have a better idea, perhaps. So let's say there's, um, there's $100,000, okay, and let's say... Your tax rate is, I don't know, 25%. So if you were to take it all out at one period of time, there's $75,000 left over, right? And let's say if there were, if there's a total of three siblings, maybe it's three siblings plus, plus Abel, I don't know, but if there's a total of three siblings, then each sibling would get $25,000. Maybe you keep it in the IRA, but you just use other money, if you have it, and just pay your siblings $25,000. That way there's no current taxation so <clears throat> how about that yeah no I, I like if that's truly the the issue because sometimes we get questions is that all right Abel's the the, the, the trustee of this um, or executor or whatever of, of the estate dad dies and then him and his four siblings or three siblings were named beneficiaries of uh, annuity IRA yeah and then it's like okay well how do you split it? How annuity? do you split that? So it could be that question. I agree. And that's a lot easier than Al's <laughs> scenario. <laughs> well, that's if I'll it, take the road less travel. Yeah, well that's if that's if it went to Abel only. So you're saying father left the IRA to the, the kids and now Abel's trying to figure out how to split this annuity three or four ways. How would you do that? Well, it's in an IRA, first of all, right? So that's a that's good. Um, the bad news is it's it's in an annuity. I'm not sure what type of annuity product it's in, um, but I'm guessing that Dad didn't do anything where it needs to be annuitized or or wasn't annuitized. It's just a lump sum IRA annuity um, that's sitting at MetLife. Um, you could say to MetLife and say, "All right, well here, well, I need to split this within the beneficiaries. Here's the death certificate of Dad." And then it would be, um, and, and they would cut the, the. They would split the IRA into four different IRAs, and, and into four different inherited IRAs. So yeah. Abel's, yours would say your father's name. Let's call him. What's it? Cain. Cain. <laughs> Cain and Abel. Look at that. We're getting biblical. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Jonathan is your father's name. Let's say, and it would say Jonathan. The father's name is Adam. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> For the benefit of Abel, okay, and then, then it would he would do this. You would do the same thing for all four siblings that you have, okay, or three siblings that you have. So the titling would be your father's name deceased when on whatever date that he died for the benefit of the beneficiary, and then now you would have four separate IRAs that are split, with each of the beneficiaries has full control of their own IRAs. You do have to take a required minimum distribution from the inherited IRA based on your life expectancy. Now, if the trust was the beneficiary of the account, right, and if it wasn't a see-through or look-through trust, now you could be um, stuck with having to take the required distribution based on the oldest sibling or the oldest beneficiary. So... When you have IRAs or annuity IRAs and all this other stuff at death, it, I mean, it, it stuff gets fairly complicated. It does. Um, 
especially let's say if he just put Abel's name down and says, Abel, you know, you're my oldest. I trust you. Just make sure you take care of the kids. Right. Well, Abel's, you know. How do I do that? Yeah, how, how the hell do I get it and out so, of the retirement account? And, and if that's the case, you go with my answer and come up with something creative. Otherwise, you got to just withdraw it and pay the tax on it. And you could do that potentially. And But then there could be surrender charges on the annuity and all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Right? So, so that may not be what you want to do, but that may be your only choice. On the other hand, if it's what you th- were thinking, Joe, which is it's, it's in the different siblings' names, but you just have to take a single product and split it three or four ways, then... And then they could do a, a, a direct custodial transfer into sure. Fidelity, Vanguard. But do you think the annuity company would take an annuity and split it four di- into four different contracts? Like if there's four different kids. Um, I, I don't know the answer to that. You could probably, yeah, I don't, I would move it out first. If you could, if there wasn't a big surrender. Yeah. So, all right, great question. Need more information as always. Okay, uh, we got uh, Dave. He writes in from Arizona. Not not very. Sp- that's a big state. <laughs> yeah, no. Tucson, very specific. It could Phoenix, be Phoenix, Scottsdale. Yeah, I don't know Yuma. Yuma, yeah. that, that could be. Oh, you're the headliner. Big, big Al. Al, I got the headline. Andy and Joe. I'm. You hardly got mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> he, he typed it. Forgot about me. <laughs> Love the show. I have a qu- uh, he's got a question regarding TOD transfer on death beneficiary designations. Uh, my mother, a widow in Arizona, wants to avoid her will going to probate. Okay, she has set up her estate to be TOD transfer of death for all of her investable assets. She has eight beneficiaries: three children, five grandchildren. She wants to designate her primary residence in the same manner where she would designate the eight beneficiaries in a TOD on the title of her home. As her executor, I'm fine with the TOD on our investable assets as it's easy to do and a good solution to avoid probate. However, I'm wondering if there's a better way to handle the real estate as it seems that it may get messy with so many individuals as beneficiaries on a primary residence. Uh, We would plan to sell her home if something happened uh, to liquidate, and um, he's interested in your thoughts. Alan. My thoughts. Well, I think, Dave, uh, this plan does work. It does. And uh, so uh, I think not everyone realizes this. Maybe let's talk about difference between wills and trusts. So, so with a will, typically the assets get distributed in accordance with your will, and if it's above certain dollar amount based upon the state that you live in, it goes to probate. Now, there is a workaround. And the workaround is this transfer on death designation. And, and by the way, we're talking about non-retirement assets only. Retirement assets like IRAs, 401ks, Roth IRAs, those have beneficiary statements anyway, or already, I should say. So they do not go through probate. But what does and what can go through probate is your non-retirement assets. But that workaround is you set up a transfer on death designation, and it's it's relatively easy for bank accounts, for brokerage accounts, things like that. It's relatively new, Joe, that you can start doing it with real estate, at least in California. Right. It was probably, gosh, I want to say three, four years ago that it, that, that it became available in California. I don't know Arizona law as well, but based upon Dave's comments, it sounds like Arizona has a similar rule, transfer on death. It is messy, though, because now you got eight people on a deed, which is probably what would happen in the will anyway, right? So the only, the only way to make it less messy is if there's enough assets so that maybe one or two of the kids can be on the home and the other kids get the liquid assets, but you know th- there may or may not be enough assets to do that. Usually what most parents are trying to do is make it equal for their kids. And if they have a home with a lot of equity and just a few other assets, it's, it's pretty hard to avoid that. But Dave's saying he's cashing it out, right? He's going to sell the house so cash is going to be distributed anyway. Well, he he says but, he says we would plan to sell her house if something happened so, to her. Right. Well, well yeah. something's going to happen to her, Alan. <laughs> Eventually, <laughs> we I just guess, don't know. I guess when. it's true of all of us. Huh? Yes. Right. Yes. So liquidation would not be an issue. I don't know. I, with eight beneficiaries, you know, just get a living trust. Spend a couple thousand bucks. Avoid the headache, and then right, you're the trustee. You cash, uh, you're in charge, right? And then, so there's not eight 
different people on the deed. Yeah. So right. So so so, yeah. so you sell the house. You're in charge. You put everything in cash, and then you just cut checks, eight different checks to the benefit. Um, you know the yeah. Beneficiary. So let's go down that path a second, because either way you avoid probate. But in the case of the living trust, it's owned by the trust, and it can be distributed to all eight kids. You know, as a as a tenant in common interest, or the trustee can just sell the property, as you said, and and the trustee can sign because trustee of the trust of the trust can sign, and then you're right, you can distribute it eight ways. So that that is simpler. Uh, if uh, the property is going to be sold before she passes, it, it it doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter, right? But I if don't it's, think she if, needs a place to live, Al. Yeah, well, it, it, <laughs> it, it says sell the house if something. Uh, something happened. happened. Death. Yeah, well, no, it, it could be. It, well, it could also That's be. That's just a polite. It's his mother. No, yeah, no, you know, no. It could be going to happen. Long-term care. Okay. She doesn't need the home anymore. All right. Anyway, what do you say? Oh, I mean, that's just a polite way to say dying. Yeah, or going to long-term care facility. Well, so it, the fact th- that it says if something were to happen to her it leads me to believe that he's not talking about when she ultimately passes. He's talking about something ha- happening to her in the meantime. But she she may never pass. Maybe she's a vegan. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, no. Yeah. So anyway, you are you are right. Um that is the the best way is to put in a living trust, and, and but I mean and, and that's then, a lot of beneficiaries. I mean, you, you when when things happen, when people start getting inheritances, it yeah. changes family dynamics. It can, yeah. And if you don't have a very good written estate plan, um, it can get ugly. Yeah, and so let's just go down the path, uh, w- which is what Dave is saying. He puts it in a transfer on death with eight beneficiaries. So she passes away. Now there's eight owners. So they, when they decide to sell the property collectively, which is hard for eight people to agree. Yeah, I got but, five grandchildren in there. But, yeah, uh, but what, hap- what has to happen is all eight need to sign the final closing documents, and that, that can be difficult to say the least. Yeah, uh, Dave, go with the living trust. Spend a couple thousand bucks. Have mom buy it, you know, and then I think that's your much life simpler. Be a lot easier. All right, uh, we'll see you next week. Show us how your money well. Whether the concern is illness, incapacity, going into long-term care, passing, or even divorce, nobody wants to be bogged down with paperwork when those events happen. Save the headache. Download and fill out the estate plan organizer now with all of your accounts, beneficiaries, trusts, wills, and insurance policies, and then store it in a safe, easily accessible place for your loved ones. Don't forget to update it regularly. The estate plan organizer is in the podcast show notes at yourmoneyyourwealth.com. Click the link in the description of today's episode in your podcast app to get it. We've got a few Arizona derails at the end of the episode. Stick around for them if you enjoy the off-topic banter. Your Money, Your Wealth is presented by Pure Financial Advisors. Click the free assessment button at yourmoneyyourwealth.com and sign up for a totally free two-meeting financial assessment either in person or via web meeting with a certified financial planner from Pure. Pure Financial Advisors is a registered investment advisor. This show does not intend to provide personalized investment advice through this broadcast and does not represent that the securities or services discussed are suitable for any investor. Investors are advised not to rely on any information contained in the broadcast in the process of making a full and informed investment decision. You ever been to Yuma? Uh, driven through it. Oh, yeah. I have never stopped there. Yeah, I've stayed in I know you, you, a couple I know. of times. Yeah, you, you really like that place. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I went to Padres, um, where they call it, preseason in Yuma, and I met Ozzy Smith, I think was his name. Well, that was, was a long time kid. ago. Yeah. Way back yeah. when. Yeah. yeah. I don't think they, they, they're not in Yuma anymore. I no. don't believe. They're I was like pe- 10, they're so. They're in Peoria. 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 Thank you, Alan. Which is Phoenix area. Yes. Just in case you want to know. All not right. Illinois. You know, my my parents finally got a living trust just a, a, maybe three years ago, and they're in their 80s. 80s. Yeah. And the reason they didn't is my dad one time read an article that living trusts are not for any everyone. And so then he decided, because he didn't really understand them. Yeah. He didn't talk to you first? <sighs> well, he, he just didn't. He told me. He said, I, I don't like trusts. I don't understand trusts. And I told him, no, this is like a flow-through trust. It's like it's not even there. But it, but all my all my property has to be in the name of the trust, and I lose control. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's a perception when you don't really know. Anyway, he finally yeah. has a living trust. Now. I was the executor of my grandmother's estate that lived in Tucson, Arizona. Oh. 
And so, right, right next to Dave, maybe. Yeah, right next to Dave. Right. He saw, he saw that estate sale. <laughs> <laughs> we started getting. His... He got a little worried. <laughs> yeah, because, he was uh, like, maybe I should check out this transfer. He, yeah. he saw how how clean it was when <laughs> yeah, you did it. Yeah, right. <laughs> but everything was really smooth, it, it, except for my grandmother had a, a safety deposit box. Yeah. Right. I had no clue. Right. And guess what was in the safety deposit? All right, so there, everything was titled in the name of the trust. Okay, but okay. she kept the stock certificates. Oh, certificates in the in the box. Okay, instead of a brokerage account. Okay, so I had to go into the, the safety deposit box. I found this key. Yes. But then she's like, "Well, you're not a, you're not an authorized user. You can't get into. You it. can't get into the box." Well, didn't you show a death certificate? I didn't, showed a death certificate. I showed the living trust. Yeah. I showed. Right. You needed Geraldo Rivera. No, I didn't. I needed something. and uh, But no, I, she was a very nice person. And so I kind of told her the story. Hey, this is it. Blah, blah, blah. But she's like, okay, well, how much how much do you think is worth in the box? And Because there's dollar figures, yeah, right? Or right. else it would have had to go through probate or something like that. I sure. said, I don't know. It was, it's probably just like it's, you know, some pictures of... Her grandkids. Yeah, a few <laughs> years ago. Yeah. Priceless. <laughs> Priceless. And so, yeah, I get in the box, and there's like a couple hundred thousand dollars worth of GE stock that was titled in the name of the trust, but it the, the stock certificates were in the stupid Got it. safety deposit box. Okay. 